But it's also a question that I'm, I'm not sure that even I uh, ask myself, you know, regularly enough about it. Every one of us lives on one of three basic levels. The first level may be what you call the survival level. Most people in the world, I think, live in a survival mode. They, they're really not living. They just exist. They put in their time. They maybe punch the time clock. They live for the weekends when they can do something different. They never really have any important goals or major perspectives that drive their, their life. They just get by. In fact, if you find yourself uh, frequently fantasizing about escaping to Tahiti, it might be a telltale sign that you're in this mode. Well, most of us, I don't think, fortunately, most of us are not in that mode. We live on a slightly higher level. We might call this level the success level. You know, the very fact that you live in America probably means that you are in this group. You know, most of the world would love to have our problems. We sometimes worry about paying the mortgage or the rent, and millions of others worry about getting the next meal. You have achieved a certain level of, of success. Every one of us have. Your needs are met. Maybe not all of your wants, but your very basic needs are met. You have a place to stay. You have possessions. You have a measure of respect from other people. You can enjoy certain pleasures, you know, like Snickers ice cream bars or cinnamon rolls, or Krispy Kreme donuts, or movies, or TV, or computers, or texting on your cell phone, you know, whatever turns you on. We all have things that we enjoy. We have a measure of success that many people in the world do not have like that. And yet, a number of surveys have shown that Americans are saying things like, well, if I'm successful, so successful, why do I feel so unfulfilled, so, so empty? Why is there still a hole in my heart? The answer, of course, I think, uh, is because success, as we normally define it, never satisfies completely, does it? A number of best-selling books from, from years past, I think, talk about the dark side of success. It's amazing how many there were, and I'm only naming just a few that I ran across or uh, heard about anyway. One of them was called Downshifting, Reinventing Success on a Slower Track. Another was, Is It Success or Is It Addiction? And then another one said, The Success Fantasy, When All You've Ever Wanted Isn't Enough. And then another, Quiet Desperation, The Truth About Successful Men. About 15 or 20 years ago, Forbes magazine had a special issue that came out. And if you're familiar with that magazine at all, you know it's not for people that are on welfare. You know, it's for people that are more successful, that make money. Many of their uh, subscribers are millionaires. But they had this edition, special edition in which they were talking about that we, that we in America have more blessings than any country and any people, any society in the history of the world, and yet we're probably, more, we're probably a people that more of us are discouraged. Depression is a major problem in America, and yet we're some of the most wealthiest and prosperous people in the world. And they asked the question, why is that? Now, I don't remember. I did read a lot of the article, and I don't remember what all was there, but I think it's interesting to note that they even came out with that kind of a an issue. And all of that says the same thing, that it takes more than success to satisfy. See, for genuine, long-lasting satisfaction, you've got to go to another level, and we might call that third level the significance level. And the significance level is when you know what you're doing here on this earth, why you're, why you're here. You know that life matters, and that meaning exists beyond your daily circumstances. You have a, a purpose for living. People who find significance are not those who are told they're special. They are those who know what on earth they are here for. I think there is a difference between those two things. I believe that God wants us to be a purpose-driven people. Now, I know that Rick Warren made that, that statement or that phrase famous but he didn't invent it. I know there were others. And some of what I have to say, you will find in his book, but not all of it. I didn't base my sermon on that book, by the way. I, I just want you to know that. Uh, God is purpose-driven himself. 
You know, the universe wasn't created on a whim. Neither was the earth, and neither were human beings. Now, I don't know. I don't know, and maybe you don't know, why God created all of those things. But our text from Proverbs, I believe, indicates that none of it was done, none of it was d done on a whim. God had a purpose for what he did, including those who were evil. I'll say something again about that in just a moment. But another significant reason, before I get to there, I want to talk about this. Another significant reason why I think this is true is because of the cross of Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ was, was part of God's eternal plan. The Bible tells us that. That's not speculation, that's revelation. In 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 20, the Bible tells us, Therefore you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Did you get that point there? He was chosen before the creation of the world. God had a purpose in mind. The cross was not a whim. It was not a, something just happened in history. That somehow it was an afterthought of God. He planned it from the very beginning. And that suggests to me that everything God does, as, long with, as, long, as well as along with that Proverbs passage, everything was done because God had in mind. In Proverbs it mentions there even the wicked play a part in God's plan or purpose. He shows through them the consequences of judgment, what it means to go against his will and do the things that he does not want in this world. So even they serve a purpose, God's purpose, in this life. If you're alive, and I assume most of you are this morning, I hope nobody's <laughs> passed on yet. Uh, we don't want to call, not have to call 911 here. But anyway, if you're alive, you're not an accident. Now, your parents may not have planned you, but God did. Now, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't think that God has a specific purpose for everyone, for you, for me. It's true, as we read through the Bible, that God chose Noah, a specific, specific man, for a specific purpose. He chose Abraham, a specific man, for a specific purpose. He chose Moses for a specific... A specific, specific I'll get it out in a minute here. I may have to clean my bridge here, but anyway... Uh, a specific man for a specific purpose. Boy, you get to say that, it gets a little difficult. Isn't it? <laughs> a lot of the prophets are that way too. You know, we read in the Bible that God had in mind for them something specifically to do. But as you look at the Bible overall, that was not the norm for everyone. And so let's not expect that God has something specific in mind for me to do necessarily. Out of all the millions on earth, God chose only a few for specific purposes. He chose them to participate in actively carrying out his uh, job here, his work here upon this earth, his purpose here upon earth and, earth, and he had specific jobs for them to do. But the overwhelming theme of the Bible is human redemption, and God was using those people in specific ways to carry out that plan of human redemption. And I think as we read through the Bible, we see how that was true. What part Noah played in it, and Moses played in it, and Abraham played in it. But did you know that we can also play a part? Now, it may not be the same kind of thing, the same kind of way, but we can have, uh, we can participate in some way in God's plan to redeem human beings from the sin that, that, that so has, has so overwhelmed our world. We just need to be sure that whatever we do, we're driven by his purposes. And you know, the tragedy is that, 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 that most people have no idea what their purpose in life is. Now, here's where I'm going to quote a little bit from Rick Warren, and I think it did come out of that book. I forgot where I got this. This is a sermon that I preached probably 20 years ago, and I've reworked it a whole lot. It doesn't sound the same. So where you heard it 20 years ago, you'll probably recognize it's different now. Anyway. He did a survey, a kind of an on-the-street survey, you know, interviewing people about what they thought the purpose in life was. One of them said, the purpose in life is to have a good time and enjoy your life. Do good to others as those who do good to you. Well, he kind of got part of it right there anyway, didn't he? Another one says, to have fun. Another one said, to be a good citizen. Raise a family, good family morals, good family values. Another said, be happy. Another said, have a good time. Go a little crazy sometimes. Another said, to bring as much into this world as you possibly can and get as much enjoyment out of it. 
not sure what they meant by bringing into the world. I don't know. Anyway, to me, another said that to me, the purpose of life is to have as much fun as possible in as short a time as possible, so you can take care of business. Definitely, number one is having fun. Another said, I think the meaning of life is serving God and family. Another one said, just to promote the family, promote children. Years ago, it wasn't that important, but now I've got a daughter, a little baby, and it's a whole different story. Another said, to be happy and to enjoy my family and praise the Lord. Another said, trial and error. I think as you get older, hopefully you get more mature and have experiences that you can pass down to your children, and they in turn can pass it on to their children. Now, some of those are not too bad, are they? Another one said, to serve God. I do a lousy job of it, but I try. Another one said, I can't say I know the purpose. I think after I die, I'll find out the purpose of life. Might be a little late then, but anyway. Another one said, my purpose, uh, I think my purpose is, and they thought about it a minute, and said, I really don't know. But you know, after reading that list, and it was a little bit lengthy, but after reading that list, I'm not sure most of those people knew what the purpose in life was. I think it's obvious that the world around us, maybe even us, needs some clarification of that. First and foremost, our purpose in life is to honor God. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verses 4 through 7, uh, we read this. Since you are precious, and I realize that the prophet here, Isaiah, is talking to the nation of Israel. We're going to need to apply it to us, and I believe that it does, and I'll show that very clearly here in just a moment. Since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And then in verses 20 and 21, he says this. The wild animals honor me. God is talking here through Isaiah. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I I, uh, formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. This principle, I believe, is, is eternal, that we are created to honor God. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 in the New Testament, the Bible says, But you, speaking about Christian people, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises him, of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We declare by the things that we say, by the things that we do, by our very lives, the excellencies of the God who created us. And that leads to another point, and I think that is that our purpose purpose is to make the cross a way of life. Um, And God, of course, will be honored by that. In Philippians chapter 2, in verses 12 through 13, the Bible there tells us, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And that passage doesn't mean, as as some have taught, that our continued salvation uh, depends on the works that we do after we are saved. Now, those are important, but that's... Our works are not in the sense of guaranteeing our eternal destiny. The cross of Christ has already settled that issue. This passage means that we should allow the cross to become the principle by which we live every day. Work out the salvation that you have through Christ Jesus by the way that you live. That's what he's getting at there. You have entered into a relationship with the creator of the universe through Jesus, his son. And now he's saying, live up to that relationship. Work out the salvation that you have so that it shows others who you are. The cross of Christ established a principle for living. In John chapter 12, shortly before Jesus was betrayed and then crucified, he said these words to his disciples there, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. <clears throat> in that text, I think it's obvious that you saw at the very beginning, Jesus is referring to his own upcoming death on the cross. But he concludes by making, it, making this, this principle of the cross a principle of life. Only by giving our lives away, as Jesus did, will we truly find the kind of life that has an eternal quality. The cross of Christ should dramatically influence the way you view life and death, grief and joy, discouragement and hope, conflict and peace, and on and on. And it should effectively influence your actions in all of those circumstances. And of course, when you do that, God will be honored. He will be glorified. But it will also make a huge difference in the quality of your life. Instead of the early Christians, in a video series that I saw one time, they knew how to die. When forced into the Roman arena to meet a horrible death, few blubbered about the unfairness of it all or pled for mercy. Instead, they came into the arena singing hymns of victory and hope. Gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. The Romans did not know what to think about that, except to realize that death was different to these people who were called Christians. And as a result of that example, as well as numerous others that the Christians gave in their, with their lives back then, Christianity eventually took over the empire. You know, a, a, a purpose-driven life has some, some practical applications as well. We've dealt with kind of general principles here, I think, but when we apply them, it brings some practical benefits into our lives. For one of the things, it reduces frustration. If you don't know the overall direction of your life, daily decisions become haphazard. I think that's also true in a church as well. You know, that great theologian in Alice in Wonderland one time said, if you don't know where you're headed, any road will get you there. And that's true. You know, we, we fill our lives, with, uh, our calendars rather, with, with, with uh, schedules and scheduled things in our calendars to help us through life. And we set goals, but wherever that, where is that taking us? Where are we going with it? Now, this, isn't, this sermon today is not about meeting goals. It's, it's about knowing the general direction of your life. It's about finding answers for questions. What's the objective? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is the purpose in my life? Do I matter? You know, day-to-day -day decisions become difficult if you don't know your purpose. Um, if you know your purpose, what your, your purpose in life is, when you're confronted with some kind of a, a dilemma or a, a decision that needs to be made, it helps to be, ask yourself, will this activity fulfill that purpose or help it in some way? If so, you do it, and if it doesn't, then you don't. It's really that clear. Now, you know, I thought, as I thought on that one point, even this morning as I was sitting back there, I thought, you know, Lloyd, that's easy to say. It's not as easy to do, is it? Because I'm sure there are times, I know there have been times, in my life when I was faced with a decision, when I didn't ask myself, what am I doing here? What's my purpose? And let that, the answer to that question determine the solution to what I was seeking. I know I haven't done that. And yet, the more I thought about it, the more I also realized it really is as simple as that. To help us make the decisions. You know, we're bombarded with choices in today's world. Once upon a time, I can remember back that far, there was only one kind of Coca-Cola. Now there's 12, at least 12. According to one study, uh, there's over 200 new grocery products that hit the grocery stores every week. I didn't realize that because I haven't gone looking for them. But anyway, uh, you know, we're, we're faced with all kinds of choices, aren't we? It's difficult sometimes to choose. But those kinds of things are very simple choices in life, aren't they? What happens when you're confronted with some very serious concerns? 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, the Bible there speaks about people who are tossed about by every wind of teaching. You know, the deceitful teachers, and there were plenty back during that time, easily led people astray, those people astray who were tossed about. Without a biblical, accurate view of life, choices can become downright frustrating and maybe even depressing as we're tossed about trying to decide what to do. Why are you a Christian? If you don't know why you're a Christian and what it's all about, you know, a frustrating sense of, of, of a lack of direction can set in, maybe even hopelessness. So in the same way, the church also needs to know why it's a church and what that means. Living a purpose-driven life gives hope to people as well as to churches. But there are other benefits, and we could go on and on, just mention a couple. It, increases your frust- it decreases your frustration, but it increases your motivation. If you don't have a purpose, why get up in the morning? Why make any effort? You know, most people sort of drift through life. They're, they're battered and controlled by circumstances. And so the question is, well, how do I get motivated? Well, I think the secret of energy, the secret of motivation and and enthusiasm in life, of lasting change, is simply to discover our purpose. That's what motivates you to get out of bed in the morning, really, or should, I guess. When you wake up in the morning, you can either face the day with an attitude that says, Good Lord, it's morning. Or you can face it with an attitude that says, Good morning, Lord. And you think about, What am I going to do today to meet my purpose and to honor and glorify you? I don't think I ask myself that often either (laughs) when I get up in the morning. But it is kind of as simple as that, isn't it? Which response you choose, I think, is determined by whether you recognize your your purpose in life. Having a purpose in life gives you hope. Everybody needs to have hope. You know, you have to have hope to cope. When you discover, not only in your mind, but also in your heart, why God put you on this earth. Your motivation level goes up dramatically, and you can face every day with a greater enthusiasm than you had before. Understanding your purpose, becoming a purpose-driven person also allows you to focus on the important things. You're able to sort those kinds of things out and and, and put some value on them as to what is important and and what is not. Uh, knowing and fulfilling your purpose attracts cooperation it helps people cooperate together people work better together when they come at life with a common purpose it's hard you know for us whether, whether that's in a, in a family whether it's in a, any kind of a group or it's a business or, or even in the church to work together and accomplish much unless we're all going the same direction According to the prophet Amos, the biggest problem between Israel and their God was their lack of agreement on this matter. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, the Bible there tells us, the New Living Translation, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? Well, that just sort of makes sense. You know, I want to go this way and somebody else wants to go that way, and if that's we can come to an agreement, we're not going to walk together. It's just impossible. You know, it's hard to imagine life without purpose, really. Now, hopefully, that doesn't describe very many of us here this morning, that we realize we have purpose. But if it does, I hope that this lesson has helped just a little bit. And it's also true that all of us need to pause from time to time, I believe, and remind ourselves why we're here. We're made in the image of God, and there, are reason why he put you, there is a reason why he put you on this earth and why he put me on this earth. And so may we all begin to refocus on God's purpose for us and let it change our lives. Will you join with me in a prayer as we end? Father God, Lord, I confess to you that I have many, many times lost sight of this simple fact that my purpose here on this earth is to glorify you, that my life should be one that reflects the purpose of the cross, the principle of the cross. And that in doing that, Father, it not only enriches my life, but it enriches the lives of those that are around me. Father, forgive me for not being alert to that as often as I should. Forgive us all, in fact, Father, 
for recognizing that many of the difficulties that we have, the differences that we have that drive us apart as a people in families, in, in homes, in churches, in schools, in groups, everywhere. Father, the differences are there because we are not agreed on what we're here for. So, far, Father, forgive us and help us to focus on those things and to be determined, Father, in whatever we do, whether that's as an individual or as a group, to want to honor and glorify you with all that we are, with all that we can be. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you're here this morning and just need the prayers of brothers and sisters in Christ to, to help you with some difficulties maybe that you're facing, to focus, refocus maybe on that purpose in life, well, we'd encourage you to come forward and we'd be glad to pray with you, pray for you at that time. And if you haven't entered into a life with Jesus Christ, we have a baptistry here. As Ethan often says, you know, we don't understand what that's about, being immersed into Christ. We'd be glad to talk to you about that as well. But whatever you need, we encourage you to come while we stand together and while we sing. What can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole?